Women are often given a bad rap and turned into the villain when really it's the men around them doing the heinous things. Yoko Ono? Ever consider that John was just sometimes a bit of a prick? Some of the female villains in Disney movies, frankly, highly relatable. Meredith Blake was just trying to get her bag when those parent trap twins came along and bullied her out of her relationship while her alleged partner watched and giggled. Like, women aren't the villains here. Unless, of course, it's Ginny Thomas. Ginny is not the hapless victim surrounded by conniving men. To be sure, her husband, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, is as conniving as they come and has turned the institution on which he serves into a fucking mockery. But Ginny is conniving in her own right, meddling. Scheming. And yesterday, a news story broke about that improper meddling, adding to the chorus of evidence that, despite not serving on the bench, Ginny Thomas is doing just as much as the actual justices to undermine the legitimacy of a stalwart institution of American democracy in a way never seen before in U.S. history. And for legal purposes, everything that I say in this video is just alleged unless proven by a court of law. So come on down and get ready to play the Name and Shame game, featuring a maniacally laughing Clarence Thomas, the smug Samuel Alito, his wife, Martha Ann, and the upside-down flag in their front lawn. And now, here's the star of the name and shame game, Ginny Thomas! A longtime Republican from Middle America, Virginia Thomas grew up in beautiful Omaha, Nebraska, the youngest of four children to an engineer father and a stay-at-home mother with a side gig as a conservative activist, both of whom were Republicans, members of the unhinged John Birch Society, and loved good down-home family values. A power-hungry hanger-on from a young age, Ginny aspired to be elected to Congress while she was still in high school, serving on student government, debate club, and the Republican club. What a nerd! She cut her teeth in politics while a student at Mount Vernon College for Women, working at the national headquarters of Ronald fucking Reagan's 1976 presidential campaign. In 1983, Ginny graduated from Creighton University School of Law with a JD, and from 1985 to 1989, she worked as a labor relations specialist at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where she represented the interests of the business community when arguing against the passage of such legislation as the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, which inconveniently required employers to give employees unpaid leave to care for a new child or seriously ill family member or to recover from a serious illness. Fucking communist garbage! During her time at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce while attending a small roundtable conference on affirmative action, Ginny met divorcee single father and head of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Clarence Thomas. Thank you to my partner on today's video, PDS Debt. Credit card debt sucks. I've talked about this before, but I've been buried under more credit card debt than I care to admit to, and I can tell you that finally paying it off feels amazing. But it takes work, because getting into credit card debt is really easy, but getting out? Well, the system's set up so that we can't. If you're struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills, you need to check out PDS Debt. PDS provides a service to match you with debt solutions tailored to your financial situation, and they have a team of people ready to help you with your debt journey. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis, and it only takes 30 seconds. Head over to pdsdebt.com Miller to get your free debt assessment today. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. Everyone with over $10,000 in eligible debt qualifies, and there is no minimum credit score required. If if you're making payments every month on your debt, but your balances just won't seem to go down, this program is for you. Stop waiting and start saving. Take advantage of PDS Debt's free debt analysis just for my viewers. Go to pdsdebt.com Miller to complete the quick and easy debt assessment in just 30 seconds. That's pdsdebt.com Miller. Thanks, PDS Debt. They started dating and a year later were married. Interracial marriage had been legalized by the Supreme Court in Loving versus Virginia in 1967, but in the late 80s, it was still a talking point. Ginny's uncle said of the couple, I can guarantee you I was surprised when I found out she was going with a black man, to which her aunt added, but he was so nice we forgot he was black, and he treated her so well all of his other qualities made up for his being black. Touching, really. In 1991, Ginny returned to government, working in the Legislative Affairs Office of the U.S. Department of Labor, where she did such public service as arguing against comparable worth legislation that requires women to be paid the same as men for the same work. That same year, 1991, Clarence Thomas was nominated by George H.W. Bush to the Supreme Court. Ginny sat by his side as Anita Hill credibly and publicly accused him of workplace harassment when he was her boss at, ironically, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. To Ginny Thomas, the accusation 
accusations were evidence of a vast left-wing conspiracy. To friends of Clarence Thomas while he was at Yale Law and working at the EEOC, when they heard Anita Hill testify that Thomas once picked up a can of soda and asked her, who has put pubic hair on my Coke? That was just old Clarence being Clarence. A 1994 book called Strange Justice quotes his colleagues and classmates calling him one of the crudest people I have ever met, profane, scatological, and graphic. To those with more limited vocabulary, scatological means poop, just so we're clear. One classmate said he used language that would have reduced other people to tears. He carried porn in his back pocket and openly described the X-rated movies he went to see in downtown New Haven. A woman describes visiting his apartment when he worked at the EEOC and every wall was covered with posters of naked women. He was not, as you might guess, a horny 19-year-old college student at that point, but in fact, a Yale Law School-educated divorcee father in his mid-30s, with posters of naked women covering his walls. So when people who knew him well heard that he made a public joke at work about pubes in his coke, they were like, good old Clarence at it again. But Ginny stood by his side through it all, sitting at the dinner table listening and engaged while Senator Joseph Biden was on speakerphone discussing the upcoming confirmation hearings, rolling her eyes and pretending to gag herself with a spoon, as Clarence Thomas's own autobiography admits to. In my heart, she said later of Anita Hill, I always believed she was probably someone in love with my husband and never got what she wanted. In the days leading up to the Anita Hill testimony, Clarence Thomas was a shell of himself. Ginny invited couples over to pray, put on Christian music and typed up his speech for him that he had written on a notepad. To say this woman played a central and pivotal role in his ascension to the Supreme Court would be an understatement. She propped him up. In his own autobiography, he describes the two of them as one being, an amalgam. When he found out he had been confirmed, he just shrugged, and then spent his first seven years on the bench completely silent. Clarence Thomas did not say a single thing or ask a single question during oral arguments for seven years. But back to Ginny. According to a recent New York Magazine article, which is great and I highly recommend you read it, it was those Anita Hill hearings that soured the Thomases to public life, to trying to pretend any sense of decorum or adherence to a set of morals. To them, their good name was irrevocably tarnished, so why even try? As evidence of the lasting impacts of the Anita Hill testimony on the Thomases, in 2010, nearly two decades after the hearings happened, Ginny Thomas called Anita Hill and left a voicemail saying, and I quote, I would love you to consider an apology sometime and some full explanation of why you did what you did with my husband. So give it some thought and certainly pray about this and come to understand why you did what you did. Okay, have a good day. In the years following Clarence's confirmation, the Thomases didn't join DC social circles the way other justices do. Instead, they hosted Rush Limbaugh's third wedding. And Ginny, trapped as she was as the wife of a political figure with ambitions since childhood of political power and leadership of her own, decided that being a smiling wife next to her husband didn't mean she couldn't also further her own ambitions and political motives. Decorum, propriety, and precedent be damned. And she started working on her ambitions right away. After meeting then First Lady Hillary Clinton, she complained about having to be respectful, cordial, and courteous. In her role as a policy analyst for Representative Dick Armey in the 90s, she was able to stir the pot further, at one point authoring a memo and sending it to multiple committees in the U.S. House of Representatives, asking them to dig up examples of dishonesty or ethical lapses in the Clinton administration. She was present during the hearings on the Clinton ethics controversy, and it wasn't subtle. Her memo was so obviously partisan and inappropriate for the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice that Democrats blew it up and posted it on an easel for everyone to see. In the middle of a hearing, Virginia Democrat Jim Moran objected to the presence of Mrs. Clarence Thomas in that bright blue dress. In 2000, Ginny Thomas took a job at, where else? The Heritage Foundation, think tank and author of Project 2025, acting as the White House liaison for the think tank and assisting with the collection of resumes for presidential appointments, even as her husband presided over both Bush v. Gore, the case that determined the outcome of the 2000 presidential election in favor of Republican and Heritage Foundation darling George Bush, son of the man who appointed Clarence Thomas to the bench. Despite being legally required to do so, Clarence Thomas failed to report Ginny's income from the Heritage Foundation year after year to the tune of a total of $680,000. Year after year, Thomas checked a box saying none in a section of the disclosure that asked for information about spousal income. None. Around that same time, in 2002, Ginny converted to to Catholicism, her husband's faith, and conveniently, the faith shared with many on the far right. Leonard Leo, 
all six of the Supreme Court's conservative justices, Paul Weyrich, founder of the Moral Majority and the Heritage Foundation. The list goes on. Then in 2008, Barack Hussein Obama was elected president and the tyranny of the left was in full force. And Ginny was right there to ride the wave of Tea Party backlash that soon followed. In 2009, Ginny Thomas, wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice, received $500,000 from billionaire Nepo baby Harlan Crow to found the nonprofit lobbying group Liberty Central. Described as a Tea Party group, when asked about potential conflicts of interest, Ginny Thomas responded, there's a lot of judicial wives and husbands out there causing trouble. I'm just one of many. In 2011, she founded Liberty Consulting, a one-woman operation where she acted as a consultant to help with political donation strategies so wealthy people had the right connections to use their money to further conservative causes. In 2011, she became a special correspondent for Tucker Carlson's Fox News show, The Wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice, meddling in campaign finance and making public appearances on the largest right-wing propaganda machine in the country. Ginny is also good friends with Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society. I did a whole video about him, who in 2011 and 2012 instructed Kellyanne Conway's polling company to pay Liberty Consulting $80,000, but bill the payments to Leo's Judicial Education Project and explicitly told Conway not to mention Ginny in the payments. And all this time, as Clarence is serving on the highest court in the land and Ginny is working tirelessly for the interests of big businesses and billionaires, they're also taking lavish trips on yachts and private jets, paid for by those same billionaires who interests Ginny is so keen to protect. Harlan Crow, whose father's company Forbes once called the largest landlord in the United States, didn't just take them on occasional trips though. They are close friends. He bought Clarence a $19,000 Bible, paid for an 1,800 pound bronze sculpture to commemorate Thomas's favorite teacher at a cemetery in New Jersey, purchased Clarence's mother's house, installed a gate, fixed the roof, and allowed her to continue living there. He paid for Clarence's adopted grandnephew's $100,000 private school tuition. Crow paid $150,000 to rename a wing of the Savannah Library in Clarence's honor. He spent $105,000 to have Clarence commemorated at Yale. And he spent millions on a museum in his honor in Pinpoint, Georgia. This on top of the half million dollars he gave Ginny to found her lobbying group. All while, according to ProPublica, many matters came and went before the Supreme Court that involved the interests of Harlan Crow's companies, if not in name, then at least enough to file amicus briefs. And then the wave of anti-progress, anti-Obama backlash crested in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump. And Ginny was right there, ready and waiting. In fact, the new breed of right-wing extremism that Trump brought with him, prone to belief in conspiracy theories, eager to drain the swamp and flout norms and expectations around decorum or, you know, the law, was the same flavor of activism Ginny had been practicing for decades. In quotes from both Ginny and Clarence, they often refer to Ginny as a troublemaker, a pixie, a rule breaker. Her public Facebook page in true boomer fashion reads, be happy, it drives the haters crazy. She once bragged about being gifted a platter that read, may all the bridges I burn light the way. Ginny Thomas's self-identity is that she's a maverick, a rebel fighting an invisible enemy, the haters. Who are the haters? Unclear. Anyone who's ever been like, hey, Ginny, maybe tone it down a bit. Maybe stop brazenly disregarding the norms that protect, I don't know, the integrity of the highest court in the land. Those all get lumped in with the same voices that said to her that she shouldn't marry a black man, that women can't do anything, that she had to be a sweet, demure, smiling justice's wife. In her black and white worldview, all of that is lumped together, along with conspiracy theories that she likes to share on her Facebook page about George Soros and school shootings, into one monolithic enemy, out to get her and her way of life. All nuances lost to blind bigotry and fear. So she found an easy and natural home among the Trump supporters that eventually paved the way to January 6th, 2021. In the days after the 2020 election, Ginny was serving on the board of the Council for National Policy, an organization representing the interests of far-right Christian nationalists and Republican activists, with the ultimate goal of establishing a Christian autocratic theocracy in the United States. Members of the group are explicitly instructed, fight club style, not to reveal their membership or even speak the name of the group. The New York Times has described it as a little known club of a few hundred of the most powerful conservatives in the country. And in the days following the 2020 election, that little club with Ginny Thomas, wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice at its helm, issued a call to action to its members to keep Trump in power, no matter the outcome of the election, instructing members to, and I quote, pressure Republican lawmakers into challenging the election results and appointing alternate slates of electors. She sent text messages, regularly checking in with Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, 
urging him to push claims of voter fraud and work to prevent the election from being certified, often referring to her best friend, aka Clarence, to indicate his support in her efforts to overthrow the election. And these texts reek of unhinged boomer. Complete nonsense, with very strange placement of capital letters and punctuation. One in particular stands out. On November 19th, days after Trump lost the election, she texted Mark Meadows, the intense pressures you and your president are now experiencing are more intense than anything experienced, but I only felt a fraction of it in 1991. Yes, 30 years later, she's still talking about 1991. And who presided over those hearings in 1991 that have so defined her entire public life? One, Joseph R. Biden. This election was personal, and her actions in its wake to overturn it are clear evidence of this. Ginny personally sent emails to 29 Arizona state legislators, urging them to choose a clean slate of electors. She sent the same emails to legislators in Wisconsin. She corresponded via email about efforts to overturn the election with John Eastman, the attorney who pressured Mike Pence to reject the votes of electors and who was one of the six co-conspirators listed in Daddy Jack Smith's federal indictment against Trump that we talked about last week. He's also facing criminal charges related to the 2020 election election in Georgia and Arizona and is no longer permitted to practice law, as you can imagine. Ginny invited Eastman to speak at a gathering of frontliners, which she described as a group of grassroots state leaders. She was the administrator of a private Facebook group named Frontliners for Liberty, with a banner stating, the enemy of America is the radical fascist left. And then Ginny Thomas, wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice, personally attended the Stop the Steal rally that preceded the January 6th insurrection on the Capitol. She wasn't one of the organizers, and she claims she left before Trump even took the stage, but the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice, who once described their relationship as one being, an amalgam, was present at the start of an insurrection, and certainly pulled whatever strings she could to try to overthrow the peaceful transfer of power after a legitimate election. Later, the Supreme Court released a four-page ruling denying the Trump administration's request to prevent Congress from obtaining documents related to the January 6th insurrection. Eight of the justices agreed. Only one justice dissented. It read, Justice Thomas would grant the application. He would have let Trump block Congress from getting hold of those January 6th documents. Over and over, despite clear conflicts of interest and clear historic precedent for avoiding appearances of impropriety, Justice Clarence Thomas, now on the bench for over three decades, has refused to recuse himself, even when his wife, with whom, in his words, he shares one being, an amalgam, was so clearly involved in the controversy that Congress called her to testify. As New York Magazine recently put it, there is no obvious strategic benefit toward making a spectacle of one's lack of respect for judicial procedure. This is not useful to the Federalist Society or to Harlan Crow or to the many institutions Harlan Crow supports. It is an expression of love to Ginny or an expression of disdain for the rest of us or both. But this is a video about Ginny, not about Clarence Thomas. Of course, the two are one being an amalgam, so it is about both, but let's talk about Ginny once more. It was revealed yesterday that in a call with donors to First Liberty Institute, a religious rights legal activism group that describes itself as the largest legal organization in the nation dedicated exclusively to defending religious liberty for all Americans, which confusingly though, this group has been actively fighting against efforts to reform the Supreme Court, which isn't about religious freedom, but which in a roundabout way will absolutely help their exclusive dedication to religious freedom because actually enforceable ethics rules on the Supreme Court would preclude the six Catholic conservative justices from a lot of cases. It was revealed in that call that Ginny Thomas personally emailed the head of First Liberty Institute, far-right attorney Kelly Shackelford, saying that their opposition to court reform has benefited some judges, saying in classic boomer all caps, you guys have filled the sales of many judges. Can I just tell you thank you so, so, so much? The First Liberty Institute has repeatedly had cases before the Supreme Court most recently the religious freedom case about that football coach who forced his public school students to pray at games, and a case about a baker in Oregon who refused to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Justice Thomas has never recused himself for anything related to Ginny's behavior. As it stands, it's up to each individual justice to determine whether or not to recuse themselves, which is a laughable level of self-policing. And removal of the current justices through impeachment, especially Alito and Thomas, is pretty much impossible. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez filed articles of impeachment against both Alito and Thomas. According to impeachment scholar Frank Bowman, writing for Slate, even if it were proved that Alito personally raised flags over his residences intending to convey sympathy with a political cause and then sat in cases involving that cause, there 
there is no clear ground in either the text of the Constitution or prior precedent for impeaching a judge based on such behavior. The existing precedent involves the impeachment of Justice Samuel Chase in 1804, who made statements and rulings showing a Federalist bias for which he was impeached in the House and then acquitted in the Senate. But even though he was acquitted, that precedent has meant that the federal judiciary has scrupulously abstained from political activities and alliances in order to protect the integrity of the judiciary and also to avoid the threat of impeachment. And even though Alito doesn't seem to give two shits about the Samuel Chase precedent, his political affiliations alone don't rise to an impeachable act of treason, bribery, or other high crime or misdemeanor. AOC filed three articles of impeachment against Thomas for failing to disclose gifts and refusal to recuse himself, especially when his friends, himself, or his wife had personal or financial matters before the court. According to Frank Bowman again, the symbiotic financial relationship between the Thomases and the institutional right wing would be immediately recognizable by the founders as a form of corruption. They wrote the foreign and domestic emoluments clauses into the Constitution because they knew that crass, case-by-case -case bribery is unnecessary if one simply showers the powerful with valuable gifts. However, the articles of impeachment brought by AOC simply allege that he failed to disclose the gifts, which is required by law, but breaking that law is a civil infraction, not a high crime or misdemeanor. Further, failure to recuse oneself is not an impeachable offense. Even if taken together, the fact that Ginny was witness to and potential defendant in criminal cases arising from the 2020 election, and Clarence repeatedly votes in favor of Trump or his supporters, and the weight of judicial misconduct in light of an effort to literally overthrow the government is very heavy, even if that was enough to impeach Thomas, which it might be if enough evidence was gathered to show Clarence's contemporaneous knowledge of everything going on, the likelihood of actual impeachment is pretty much nil. Republicans control the House, so an investigation won't even happen. And even if it somehow made it to the Senate, they wouldn't even impeach Trump for literally leading the coup. They're not going to impeach a justice whose wife sent some emails, you know? As impeachment scholar Frank Bowman once more puts it, both Thomases have behaved disgracefully. They are ideologues who live high on the largesse of the movement of which they are unapologetically a part. Their tawdry example plainly demands systemic responses, enforceable recusal standards for the Supreme Court, laws regulating receipt of outside income by judges, and and perhaps more. But impeachment is off the table. And through all of this, Ginny has claimed that her and Clarence don't talk about the court. They don't talk about law. She claims he's in his legal lane and she's in her political lane. But the reality is that the Supreme Court is political period. There's a reason we note who are the conservative and who are the liberal justices. There's a reason that people like decaying turtle corpse Mitch McConnell were willing to pull stunts multiple times to ensure a Republican president got to appoint Supreme Court justices. There's a reason why the Federalist Society is willing to spend millions to prop up the appointment of certain justices. The Supreme Court is political. And the nine justices sitting on the bench, even before the Thomases and Alitos came along and made a mockery of it, have never been neutral arbiters of the law. Because that's not how humans work, and it's willfully ignorant to pretend that it is. Prejudice, bias, and societal influences affected the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott versus Stanford that enslaved people were not people, in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal is constitutional, in Korematsu versus the U.S. that concentration camps are fine on U.S. soil, but also in Roe v. Wade that choosing to have an abortion was essential to ordered liberty in Obergefell v. Hodges, that choosing who you marry is a fundamental right. The bias can be used to strip people of rights, to impose religion on the masses, to create a king out of the president. Or it can be used to extend rights as we recognize the wrongs of the past, to change the interpretation of the Constitution as the context of this country grows and changes. And we are now facing a Supreme Court willing to indulge the influences of corporate greed, billionaires, religious nutjobs, and conspiracy theorists over the influences of progress, righting past wrongs, and human rights. And until we get an enforceable code of ethics and a predictable confirmation process involving term limits, we will be subject to their every whim, no matter who wins in November. But we all know that if Kamala wins, the possibility of Supreme Court reform is still on the table. With Trump, all bets are off and it's a slippery slope towards fascism. So please vote and please publicly bully Ginny and Clarence Thomas whenever the opportunity arises. Thanks to my newest patrons, a special thanks to my royal patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patrons, T, Latranger Lucas, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, Tay, and Brett Piontek. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. Check out my Patreon if you want to get early ad-free access to all these videos. If you enjoyed this video, you'll also like the one I made about the Supreme Court's horrible ethics code. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.